going from South Africa recently. Uh, now, I think any of us in the British market are hugely aware of the potential and, and the reality of um, the Southern Hemisphere. I suppose the one big topic we haven't really discussed as we see David is Australia, is it? When it is in such a very, very particular and difficult position at the moment, and perhaps this isn't the, the time to, to go into that in detail, but um, if we're talking about opportunities and challenges, um, Australia must be up there in the forefront with the most starkly uh, outlined challenges of any mine producing country at the moment, I would think, not least because it's on the absolute front line of being challenged by climate change. Thank you, Jason. And offloading of vineyards and wineries and um, growers going out of business. So it's very, very gloomy. the last 10 to 15 years that we have seen a proliferation of new wines uh, and an explosive interest in new wines uh, and a distribution of all these new wines that have come from all these places that traditionally uh, have not come from uh, South America, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. And I think essentially what has happened is that the growth in the production of wine, the growth in actually high quality wine, outstripped beginning to outstrip the actual demand, uh, even though the demand was going up, and there were more and more people passionate about wine, there were more people from whether it's Korea, from China, from Japan, from the United States, that are drinking more and more wine, and interested in wine, the problem is they couldn't stay abreast with the production of wine from so many different areas. And I think we're seeing, and we've seen for the last year, we've seen a correction. We're going through a massive correction because of the world balance. We're, we've already gone through a correction in real estate, Going through a correction in other things as well. And we're seeing this correction in wine. And I think that's the, this, this top the summit of wine is, is how often to deal with this. Because, but I think it's a, just a correction. We will come out of it. We will go back. But I am very much an optimist for the long term. Wherever I turn, I can't believe the amount of interest in wine. And this is basically confirming what, 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 what Bill said. I cannot believe the interest. I mean, I, came, I, I live in a very rural area. And when I just started writing 30 years ago, nobody in my area drank wine. And, uh, and today, every little local restaurant, little country restaurant, people are bringing bottles in and drinking wine. It's inexpensive wine. It's not fine wine, per se, but it gets them started. And I think for the long term, this is very, very positive. But certainly, we're in a massive correction right now. And Australia has certainly been impacted. Spain is also. Everyone's been impacted. Thank you both. Um, screening the questions, and uh, this, this topic keeps coming back. Uh, can Spain enter mainstream investment markets competing directly with classified growers from Bordeaux? Christopher, would you like to comment on that? Yes. Comment on that? I think it's very difficult uh, for Spain to compete with Bordeaux. Bordeaux has a very special situation, and I'm sure Mr. Bonfagné would be able to explain that in more detail. Um, a long-established uh, market in Bordeaux uh, with 300 million selling uh, wines of the country uh, worldwide. And it works consistently as well, beautifully. And every year, uh, the wines are sold on printer and two suitcases uh, to markets and connected throughout the world. In Spain, the very few wines that actually reach that level, uh, actually, uh, except with one exception, that is Baker Cecilia. Baker Cecilia also a long established winery, it goes back to 1564, and everybody uh, identifies uh, Baker Cecilia in Spain. And actually this very day, uh, somebody from New York told me that there is uh, an exclusive auction for Baker Cecilia. So that is one of the wineries that really can stand up to um, the collector's uh, demand. Uh, now there are a few wineries which are coming on, on the scene, much more modern. Uh, you can name Pickers, you can name Nonita, uh, all these wineries, I think, in the future uh, will become more and more famous uh, because of their outstanding quality. And uh, no doubt the other one, the Latin Plasma, which will come forward uh, as quality, is improving tremendously in Spain and will be able to be more and more interesting wine. Uh, Bob would like to come on that as well. Uh, one thing I like, if I, I don't believe in a lot of legislation or regulation, but I would wish that the word speculation be banned from the use in a sentence of wine. 
and I think I think that for the future of Spain, as successful as Vega Sicilia is, and it's a profound wine, uh, I think to believe that you're producing a wine for speculators or a wine that's going to increase in value is the wrong, wrong objective. I think the way to win the future of consumers is to produce a wine of whether it's inexpensive or whether it's expensive of high quality, but whether it's but offers value for whatever price, because the whole objective is you want people to drink your wine. You don't want people to speculate in it. And I really think this whole subject of speculation, which we hear about in, in all the magazines and the, the famous auctions, is really less than 1% of the true wine market. I'm totally against speculation in wine, even though obviously my, my scores are often used for the worst possible scenario of speculation. But I think it's a, wine is meant to be enjoyed, it's meant to be consumed, and speculation to be the dirty word.